that. We're getting ready to hop on into service, so make sure you do that. But stay tuned, y'all. Amazing message today, and we'll see you guys in just a little bit. See you soon. Oh, gosh. How are you doing, our family online? We're, we're on Mexico time this morning. Amen? Yes. No? No? It's two where, hours where, we, where the fellowship was more important, right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So we're <laughs> glad that you're here to fellowship with us. <laughs> Time together is more important, right? Um, so we, we love you, FLC Online. We're so grateful that you're here with us this morning. Um, make sure that you engage with the chat. Talk to the people that you're watching church with, right? Yep. Maybe tell them um, what your favorite thing that you did this weekend was. What was yep. your favorite thing that you did this weekend, uh, Pastor Bardo? It eat. Was, eat. Yeah. Eat. So, yeah, <laughs> if you had some good tacos, right? Yeah. Or, yeah, if, or if you had some good spaghetti, you know, whatever. Uh, and just also put it in remember, the chat. we have a... Communion. Communion. Yeah, absolutely. And if you need prayer, there's a prayer button for you to select. Um, but we love you, and we're, we're excited to worship the Lord with you this morning. I just pray that you all um, receive a, a Rima word this morning, an on-time word uh, just for you. We love you, FLC Online. We love you, family. God bless you. Amen, amen. Is anybody ready to worship this morning? Come on, does anybody have an offering that they're ready to give to our God? Well, do me a favor, let's pray. Father in heaven, we adore you, we magnify you, we love you. It is our delight to sing before you. It gives us joy to bring songs and offering, songs of offering before your throne. So we pray that you would be pleased with the sound that you hear from us today. Be magnified, be glorified, be exalted in this place. Somebody shout amen. Before we get started, family, I want to introduce you to a family member of mine. This is Miss Rachel Pierce, she, Pastor Rachel Pierce, excuse me. She has been a friend and a dear sister and mentor to me for seven or eight years now. And I have grown immensely just by being in relationship and being under her mentorship. So she's going to be leading worship with us today. So if you could give her a warm welcome and somebody shout hallelujah in this room. We sing to the ancient of days. There is nobody like him. Come on, clap your hands, hey. hey! It feels so good to be in his presence. We love to sing your praise, yeah. Oh, yeah. Come on, let's declare this together. Father, we give you blessing and honor. Blessing and honor. Yeah. Glory and power. Be to the ancient. 
come a no one like God praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is none like you. Let's settle here for a moment. There is no one like God. No one as loving as God. No one as merciful as God. No one is worthy as God. No one is holy. <laughs> no one is mighty. I don't know what you need, but no one is consistent. Mm. Nobody has the patience of our God. There's no one as faithful as our God. Man, nobody like our God. Before we get into our message, just one more time, would you give God a no one like him praise? Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Well, let's pray, y'all. Uh, we're going to pray and get right into it. Father, thank you. Thank you that there's nobody like you. <laughs> Lord, we've searched all over. We've tried to find. We've looked to find, and there's no one like you. No one can move the way you do. No one can change our situation the way you do. You are the only person in the universe that can take dust and make it beautiful. God, you're the only one in the universe that has the control of all of heaven's army, but has the audacity to be personal with people like us. So God, we just take a moment to say thank you. We say thank you. We give thanks to our God because you're faithful, because goodness and mercy follow us, because you see fit that that would be the case. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, welcome everybody to Freedom Life Church. Uh, my name is James. I'm one of the pastors here. I am really excited about diving into this message uh, this week. We've been on a journey in a series called The Church is Alive, and we've been talking about it from the perspective that if uh, God is alive in us, then we as the church have an opportunity to demonstrate what it looks like to be alive in the world. We talked about week one that Jesus is the door. In other words, the doors of the church are open, that we get an opportunity to display to the world that the doors of the church are open. If you missed that message, go check it out. But week two, we talked about Jesus is the water. The beauty of Jesus being the water is that he satisfies our soul, he nourishes our soul, and then when we say yes to Jesus, we have full access to the Holy Spirit who revives us, renews us, and then allows us to overflow in the places that we go. If you've missed those messages, go check them out. But this week, I get an opportunity to talk about Jesus is the table. I want to slow us down a little bit that Jesus is the table. And I actually want to bring you uh, to my table just for a moment. We're going to do something a little bit different today. As you're already seeing, we've got communion elements and things already lined up for you. But I, I wanted to talk about the table and invite you to sit at my table. A couple weeks ago, um, I had an opportunity um, to share with our staff that um, I was feeling, and I don't usually do well with feelings, so I'm letting you all know that in advance. Um, I was sharing with our staff that I was feeling lonely tired and discouraged. And I'm not saying that for you to give me pity or, or to say, oh, James, how can I fix it? That's not what I was looking for. I share that because it was something that was on my heart, and I didn't really know where it was coming from. As I started digging a little bit, maybe it's from the fact that I'm not as intentional as I could be in building the relationships that mean the most to me. Maybe it's because of the pace of my life. Um, I, I'm moving so fast that sometimes I don't actually spend time with the people I care the most about. But maybe as I was thinking and processing some of this, maybe some of it is the anxiety of walking into a new election year. Maybe some of it is coming from the fact that um, many of us have been living with the residue of surviving a global pandemic. Maybe it's because I know how people smiled at me, I know what they said to me, and then I watch their actions on social media or in public spaces, and I don't know who I can trust anymore. I'm just inviting you guys to the table that I sit at just for a moment. And sometimes that table feels lonely, tiring, and discouraging. And I don't say that to get your pity. In fact, I shared it with a friend of mine who's a pastor out in Richmond, and he shared with me, James, you're not the only one walking through that. 
He says, in fact, there are a lot of ministers, a lot of people in ministry who are dealing with the same exact thing. And at first, I'm like, man, this actually felt good because it feels good to be seen, right? It feels good to be seen and acknowledged by someone. But I was also convicted because as I was talking to him, I started doing some research. And what I realized is that I'm really not alone. Here's the truth. I want to show you guys a statistic. Somewhere along the lines of 52% of Americans report feeling lonely. This is 47 uh, of Americans report that their relationships with others are not meaningful. Single or adults, 57% of Americans eating alone most meals. I think it's something around that same uh, idea of 57 or 52% don't actually feel like anybody knows them well. In other words, nobody feels like they have a seat at the table. I just want us to feel the, the, the tension of this for a second. I want you to look around the room just for a moment. And here's the tension here. That at least half of the people in this room, at least half of the people will leave this worship experience. They will leave this opportunity of, of, of singing. Uh, they'll leave the message. At least half of these people will leave just the smiles and the hugs. They'll get back in their car. They'll go to their homes. They'll get with their children. They'll go to their job. Half of us will still feel lonely, tired, and discouraged. And so as a staff, we were trying to figure out how do we deal with this? If we're feeling it, if at least half of us are feeling it, how do we deal with this? And so we went to see, well, how did Jesus do it? If the church is alive because Jesus is alive, let's be honest that sometimes we can be bogged down by the experiences of our lives. But if the church is alive, how did Jesus help the church come alive? How did he deal with the lonely? How did he deal with the tired? How did he deal with the discouraged? Here it is. He invited them to his table. <laughs> Would you turn your Bibles to Matthew 26? Matthew 26. This is a snapshot of Jesus using his table in a way that changes the world. If you've got a Bible that glows, go ahead and go to the table contents and go back to Matthew. If you've got Bible with pages, it's going to be somewhat in the halfway point. Then turn a few more pages and it will say Matthew. Let's go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Here's what it says, verse 20. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve. Underline that. Highlight that. <laughs> While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Imagine starting dinner off that way. Somebody here is going to betray me. <laughs> Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, am I the one, Lord? He replied, one of you who has just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me. For the Son of Man must die as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. I want you to understand that Jesus here is not calling condemnation on this man. But he's sharing the reality that this man will experience once he leaves that place. The, the meal, the joy. But when he leaves there, he'll probably feel shameful. When he leaves there, he'll probably feel lonely, tired, discouraged. Let's keep going. Judas, the one who would betray him, also asks, Rabbi, am I the one? Judas knew he was the one. <laughs> and Jesus told him, you have said it. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Underline that. Then he broke it into pieces, gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine, gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Judas was at the table. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's pray again. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us a seat at your table. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If I had to give this message a subtext, we talked about Jesus is the table, but the subtext would be you have a seat at the table. 
The significance of this table, the reason why I said underline it, is because this table was so essential to the life of a Jewish person. And I'll even venture to say that it's essential to our lives. This table was so significant because it was deeply entrenched with spirituality. Jesus understood this. It was deeply entrenched with spirituality. This table was the space where God's presence and his people would meet. According to these Jewish folks, what would happen is the home was a representation of the temple. And if the temple was in the home, then the altar was the table. The place where sacrifice happened, the place, uh, that thin space between heaven and earth where you would meet God was at the table. It was sacred. This table was about unity. It was about uh, brotherhood, camaraderie. It was a covenant community. This was a special place, a bond that could not be broken. But you have to understand that not only was this table sacred, it was significant, not because it was sacred, but it was also separate. If this is a a covenant community, if this is a table that has a space where God meets us, then these people believe that not everybody should be at this table. For them, it was really ridiculous to have someone who's a, a Jewish person now share a meal with a Gentile because their belief system is that if you were not a part of the covenant community and you came and sat down at the table, you could pollute the covenant community. What's crazy, family is that we are not very far off from where they are. I just want you to feel what I was convicted by because a part as as I'm reading this, these tables, anthropologists call them boundary markers. They let us know who's in and who's out. They let us know who we like and who we don't like. They let us know who we can tolerate and who we don't want to deal with. They're boundary markers. They separate us. Not only do they separate us, but there's a class system and a ranking system that goes on with the table. Only certain people of importance sit at the table. Only certain people that we like sit at the table. Can I share with you that what's crazy is that some of you were alive some decades ago when we actually had signs outside of tables that read blacks and white only. In this country. Also in this country, we see so much more separation. Many of you, all of you, were alive. Who we're dealing with now, there was just a few years ago, Democrats versus Republicans. Mask versus unmask. Vaccinated versus unvaccinated. We even had more division of of black versus blue. Minorities versus majority. I could go on and on and on, but the table often for us represents a point of separation. But here's the other part of this table that I don't want us to miss. Tables also represented salvation. Because if I was invited to someone's table, if I was estranged in relationship and someone invited me to their table, I was now offered forgiveness. I was offered a mending of relationship. And salvation is not just about getting to heaven. Salvation, remember, is about getting with God's presence and his people. So now, when I get invited to the table, I've got access to healing. I've got access to forgiveness. I've got access to restoration. I've got access to new life at the table. But that was only extended to certain people. This was called uh, table fellowship. And one of the things they would do with table fellowship is that they would take the bread, the host of the dinner, the host of the meal would take the bread, they would give thanks, they would bless the bread, break it, and distribute it to others. And in giving it to others, what they were signifying is that whoever has the bread also has the blessing of the house. To have the bread means that we share in the blessing. This is all fine and good until Jesus comes along. Jesus now, because he's controversial, now takes the table and, again, flips it upside down. The way Jesus works is that this table that represented exclusivity, now Jesus says, no, 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 I'm going to make it inclusive. And Jesus had the nerve to do some really controversial things. Here's what I want you to understand. Jesus' most controversial aspect, the reason, scholars say, the reason why Jesus got himself killed wasn't because the miracle signs and wonders. People love that. Do more, Jesus. Do that stuff you do. Heal this person. Do that. That's all great. It wasn't because of his teaching. Scholars say the reason that Jesus got himself killed was because of who and how he ate. Who he ate with. 
Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. Let me just kind of put it out here so we can all understand it. Jesus' table was messy. We don't really like the fact that his table is messy. I'm going to be honest. I don't like the fact that Jesus' table is messy. When I read this text, it throws me off because I don't want us to just pay attention to all of the things that we've heard, the, the greatness of the table. Just imagine who's at the table in that moment. There's Matthew, the tax collector. Now, imagine this for a moment. We don't know what it feels like to be a tax collector. As much as many of us hate the IRS, we still don't understand the depth, uh, a depth of the tax collector. The tax collector were people who actually worked for your enemy. I want you to feel the gravity of that for a second. Imagine now the person who's hurt you the most. Imagine the person who's abused you the most. Now, let's take it a step further. Imagine the person who's hurt the one you love the most. Now, imagine them sitting at the table. <laughs> They're sitting at the table. And you're not sitting at the table so y'all can fight each other. They're sitting at the table, and they're eating the same meal you're eating. Jesus is actually serving them the same way he serves you. This is messy, Jesus. What are you doing? It was his table, though. Not only was it messy because of Matthew, Peter is there. This impulsive, failed fisherman who at a moment's notice will change his mind about everything he said he believed. One minute, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Lord. I'm, I'm 100% in. Next minute, no, no, I don't even know who he is. I want you to also see that there's Thomas at the table. He doubted. But the person I don't want us to miss, and actually I feel like we've got to spend time here, is there's Judas at the table. Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. I want you to understand this for a second. To actually Betray someone who is a part of a covenant community, someone you've shared life with, someone you've invested with, someone you've given everything to. To betray them, to be unfaithful was like a criminal offense. So when Jesus is asking this question, when he throws it out in the room at the beginning of dinner as a grenade to say, yep, somebody's going to betray me in here. Everybody would have been up in arms. Everybody would have been scared. And not only scared, but if they would have found out who it was that was going to betray Jesus, imagine how they would have responded. Peter already, a couple, a couple chapters afterwards, was cutting off somebody's ear. Imagine what he would have done to Judas. Now, Jesus says to Judas, one of you is going to betray me. Judas leans in and he says, Rabbi, is it me? <laughs> Judas knew exactly who he, what he was doing. But I want you to hear Jesus' response. Jesus says, you've said it. Check out what he didn't do. Jesus didn't say, fellas, come get him. It's Judas. We got ops. No, no, he said, no. Judas, you said that. In other words, what he's offering Judas in this moment is an opportunity to repent. He does not condemn Judas. He does not get Judas killed in this moment. He says, you said it. In other words, is that who you want to be, Judas? Is that really who you want to be? I just want you to feel the impact of that. That Jesus' table is messy, but even in the midst of the mess, he offers repentance. That you and I don't have to hide what we're going through. Judas, I was reading this. It was heartbreaking to me even when I read it this morning. Judas had an opportunity to change his life in that moment. The challenge was he decided to live in secret. What Judas was trying to do is what we often do, I know I do it, is that Judas was trying to make Jesus' table unmessy. I'm going to try to clean this up for you, Jesus. So I'm going to try to clean up Jesus' table, and so what I do is I don't show up to the table fully. In other words, I'm not going to be vulnerable with the people because I don't want to mess up Jesus' table because I already know I got mess. I, like, I know. Like, I know when I walk into this door, like, we've lost all of our perfection easily. I know I got mess. And what happens is I often struggle with this thing in my heart called self-pity. Like, here I am feeling lonely again. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares. And that self-pity often turns into bitterness. Well, I don't care about them either. I don't need them anyway. 
because I'm trying to clean up Jesus' table as opposed to just leaning into what he's doing. But, but only on top of that, not only do we clean up that way, but I don't like everybody at Jesus' table because I don't want the table to be messy. And I know that people are messy. In fact, I learned growing up that cleanliness was next to godliness. So I'm trying to make sure that I keep Jesus' table messy or unmessy by creating these boundaries and letting them know, like, your mess is not accepted here. Because I have this expectation. I know that my sins have been crucified, but it seems like the pride in my heart is dying a slow death. Because I have these expectations of people to be perfect, even when I'm not. Jesus' table is messy. But here's the beauty of this. Pastor Brian said that... (laughs) What's so fascinating is that we expect Jesus to manage his table the way we manage ours. The reality is that this is his table. So as Christians, people who follow Jesus, we ought to manage our table the way he manages his. And what he did was that he invited messy people to the table. And what he did was he shared a meal with them. I just need you to look at how intentional that was. Judas was knowing he was the guy. Jesus saw right through all of the mess. And he saw the person. Who are the messy people in your lives that Jesus has been inviting to the table? I'll leave that there for a moment. Let's go on. Because the messiness of the table is always, we said it growing up in church, that uh, with, with a mess, there's a message. So what's the message of the table? The message of the table is that whoever uh, accepts Jesus, whoever says yes to Jesus, is now invited to not only sit at the table, but to participate in the feast. You've got to understand that Judas had an opportunity to participate in the feast. The meal was already set up, and I need you to read how this worked. That everybody now is probably thinking, who is the person that shouldn't be at this table? Judas should be outed. Jesus could have easily said, you don't belong here. But listen to how they interacted with each other. Judas and Jesus are in this moment of tension. And I want you to go back to verse 25 and 26. Judas, the one who betrayed him also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? (laughs) Jesus told him, you said it. Listen to this next verse. This is so powerful. He says, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces, gave it to the disciples, saying, take this, eat, for this is my body. Let's pause for a second. He says, as they were eating. Some scholars believe that, you know, uh, maybe Judas left the table at this point. If you want to read more about what actually happened, this interaction at the table, read John 13 to 17. It's uh, the upper room discourse. But what we read here, the snapshot that we get is it says, as they were eating. Who is the they that the scripture is talking about? The disciples. Not only is it the disciples, but if you read up a couple verses, it's the 12 disciples. Now, I don't know all the names of the disciples. You probably don't either. But who were one of the disciples? Judas. I don't know if y'all caught that. You're going to betray me as they were eating. What? You're my enemy as they were eating. You're on the other side of the person I hate. You're on the other side of the line as they were eating. Like, listen, the person furthest from God and his people is now invited to participate in the feast that Jesus has laid out. Family, what I'm trying to explain to you is that this is a table of grace. Judas is a betrayer. He should not be a part of the covenant community. But because God said so, but because Jesus gives the invitation, because Jesus invites him, Judas gets an opportunity to participate in the feast. Imagine what that means to our lives. All of the blessings, all of the access of the kingdom, we are invited to participate in. And not because of who we are, but because of what he's done. I want to illustrate this just for a moment. A couple years ago, um, (laughs) some friends of ours invited Ashley and I, my wife, to go to uh, New York for a Broadway play. But it was not just any Broadway play. It was a Raisin in the Sun with Denzel Washington. Like, like, exactly. That's exactly how I felt. Like, I'm going to see Denzel a few feet away from me. Like, this is amazing. 
challenge was, at the time, uh, I was uh, a little young, I was underemployed, uh, my wife, we had just had our first baby, and we decided when we had our first baby that Ashley would stay home with the girls, so as excited as I was about going to New York to see Denzel, I couldn't afford it. My bank account would not allow me to do that. And my friend saw me, looked at me, says, I got it. You sure? He said, I got it. Fast forward, he says, I got it. We go, he picks us up from our house, and him and his wife, they pick us up from our house, and it's about a couple of hour drives, and I'm watching us pass gas stations, and he's looking back at me and say, I got it. We've gone through toll booths, and he's looking at me, and he says, I got it. I'm like, oh, no. We get to New York, I don't know if you've ever been, but parking is at least $50. He says, I got it. I'm like, thank God, because I didn't. Before the play, we go into this restaurant, and it's a restaurant off of Broadway. It's this nice Italian restaurant with a crazy menu. Only about 20 or 30 people can fit in this exclusive restaurant. We go in, we sit down, and I'm looking at the menu. Everything is $30 and above, and so I'm also looking at Ashley like, uh, we may need to just order water, and uh, hopefully they got free bread because it's an Italian restaurant. Maybe we'll... We fast in a day. I don't know how we're going to do this, but. And my friend saw me being a little awkward, probably fiddling around with, you know how we do that. We fiddle around with our, our, our car like we're going to pay for it. No, we ain't got the money to pay for it. And so he looks at me. He says, I got it. What I'm trying to communicate to you all is that at the end of the trip, he took us home, dropped us off, and didn't ask for anything in return. My friend gave me this all-exclusive, all-inclusive paid trip to New York to see Denzel Washington only because he said, I got it. I didn't have to do anything. He said, I got it. Let me bring this down to a level that we can understand. The reason that you and I are invited to the table is not because of how much money you make. It's not because of the color of your skin. It's not because of how you vote. It's not because of where you grew up. It's not because of all the things you've done. It's because of what he's done. Jesus is our friend who says, I got it. I got it. It's finished. Yep, I know you're far from me. You're the furthest from me, but I got it. I paid it all, Jesus said. So the message of the table is, come on, sit down. I got it. Stop going in back and thinking that you got to fix up my table. That's my job, Jesus says. I got it. The message of the table is that Jesus invites those who are far from him to sit and have fellowship with him. And when you sit down at his table, something happens. <laughs> the Holy Spirit gets a hold of your heart as you're eating the bread of his presence. He begins to transform how you look at things. He begins to transform how you interact with others. He begins to transform how you look at the person on the other side. He says, I got it. This method that Jesus used was table fellowship, and it was something that we can't, uh, uh, you know, kind of just gloss over what Jesus was doing is he was doing something very radical. Because the thing is, this is what got him killed but it was also what changed the world. That Jesus now decided to actually demonstrate radical hospitality. In other words, you don't deserve to be at this table. I don't deserve to be at this table because of what I've done, because of who I am, because of all the things. But he says, hey, I've prepared a seat for you. Have you ever had somebody prepare a seat for you? And it's not just any seat. He prepares a seat of honor for you. <laughs> I saw one young guy just now. I said, have somebody prepared a seat. He pointed to his mom. His mom has prepared a seat for him. <laughs> That's the implication. That you don't just get a seat. It's a seat of honor. And here's the beauty of that seat. Everybody who now eats of that bread has the same blessing as everybody else at the table. 
There are no orphans at the table. There are no grandchildren at the table. There are no great-grandparents at the table. There is no rulers and authority at the table. There is only the father and his sons and daughters at the table. This is radical hospitality, but it's different. Let me give this really quickly. It's different than entertainment. You've got to understand that. It's different than entertainment. Really quickly, entertainment is about exclusivity. It's about putting on the right party for the right people with the right attire at the right time. All of those things are about entertainment. But hospitality, the way Jesus practiced what got him killed was very different. What changes the world is very different. Hospitality is about being inclusive. Here's the challenge. It's about inviting everybody to the table. And here's what's mind-blowing. Even your enemies. Yep, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly it. <laughs> so I wish I could duplicate that sound. Oh, like it was really it. That even your enemies, Pastor Bardo said it so well. He says, listen, what if when we read Psalm 23 and God tells us that he prepares a place for us in the presence of our enemy, what if it wasn't about us sitting at a table and us being able to look at the people on the other side who we don't like, we don't vote like, we don't have the same experiences, and we say, nah, 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 boo, boo, I got a seat at the table. What if it was really saying that the reason you have a seat at the table is to point those people to the king's table? What if it was to point them to the love of the table, to the grace of the table, to the meaning of the table? This is what Martin Luther King Jr. called the beloved community. This is what Jesus practiced. This is what he invites us to practice. This beloved community includes diversity, allows for tension. How often do we not do that in our society? It's either this or that. Tension undergirded by love and leading to transformation. Can I tell you something? This is what people are waiting for. For us to be able to sit at the table, messy and all, and to say, you know what? I don't agree with you, but I love you. And I'm willing to figure out how to navigate this through the lens of a common savior. The method of the table was radical hospitality. So what does this mean for us, y'all? This is the hard part. Because I'm an introvert, and um, as a pastor, everything else, I just assume that I'm doing my job. I assume that coming on the church on the weekends, showing up, speaking a message on stage, my assumption is I'm doing the work. I'm doing evangelism. Isn't this how people get into the kingdom? Until I read scripture. That Jesus actually changed the world without having political power, without having a platform without promoting a particular ethnic identity. But he actually changed the world by taking one table to the next table, going from one table to the next table. What was so fascinating about what Jesus did is what you, if you read scripture, you realize Jesus didn't have a home of his own. So what that means is that Jesus was always going or coming from or sitting at somebody's table. And what was crazy about the table that we often mistake is that we assume that I don't have the biggest house, I don't have the, the, the most stuff, I can't invite anyone to my table. What we're called to is to meet people where they are. And so what I'm trying to get you to understand is that your table is portable. Your table is portable. And the table of Jesus Christ now is about posture and it's about practice. It's about understanding that your table might be running in the park with somebody. It's about meeting somebody at a coffee shop. Maybe it's going on a walk with someone. Maybe it's deciding to take one of the meals that you'll eat this week and decide that I'm going to meet somebody for the very first time, sit down with them, and make the table portable. Here's what's so crazy. And here's how we do it. That we take our table, we put it down. Here's a simple evangelism. You now take the bread that you've already been given. I'll take a better piece. Take the bread that you've already been given. And the bread that you've already been given, all you do now is you take it because it's been given to you all of the resources, all of the blessings, all of the joy, all of the hope, and you begin to bless others. You sit down at the table. You break it. 
bless it and you distribute it to someone and now we share in the same blessing. What if you were to sit down for a moment at the table and bless someone? This family right here, what y'all don't realize is that about six or seven years ago, we moved out here and we had no family, no friends. Titus, Lisa, Jasmine, they treated us as family. Never met me before. But Titus was a retired police officer. He would actually sit outside of my house to make sure that my wife and my daughters were safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being at the table. See, there's other people that you meet at the table too. (laughs) What you guys don't realize is that Tim here took me to a restaurant and gave me some fatherly advice. Essentially what he says is that, why don't you believe in yourself more? You challenged me in a way that only a father could. It gave me an immense, just huge confidence. Thank you for being at the table. Thank you. See, this is all we do. We, we bless it. We, we break it and we, we share with others. I'm going to lose my mind here. Because you guys see me on the stage. You see me giving these messages, but you don't see how she's prayed for me. You don't see how she's prayed for you. (laughs) Thank you for being at the table. When I had no clue of how any of this would ever work out, you've been the one pushing me to follow Jesus' leading. I'm the man I am today because you continue to show me the table of Jesus Christ. Thank you. (laughs) Family, I don't don't know what table you're at, but I want to let you know that you're invited to Jesus' table. Let me just show you this picture last, I promise, last press, last thing. I showed up feeling lonely, tired, discouraged. But at the table, I found life. At the table, I found hope. At the table, I found salvation. I need you to look at this picture because in this picture, there's nobody who's perfect. In this picture are people just like you and I, and not everybody is in this picture. And what it's signifying is that there's more room at the table. And what we're saying is that not, we're, not that we're special, but what I want you to catch is that you have a seat at the table. And the table is not some special table. Uh, it's not because we make it special. The table is special because Jesus Christ is the center of the table. All of the folks online were joining us. I know my family members are watching it right now. Thank you guys for being a part of my table, the table of Jesus Christ. I want to pray for us. And I want us to spend some time. I've already talked with some of our folks in Ivy that we're going to just take some intentional time to sit and be reminded of what it means to be at the table of Jesus Christ. You and I didn't deserve to be here Our very presence makes it messy. But Jesus says, I've got a seat of honor for you. He's leveled the playing field so that you and I could sit at his table. I could give this bread out to everybody in this room because at different points in my life, you've actually impacted me and so significant. I'm looking, I'm trying not to move forward, but I'm looking at Miss Carrie. She just said, we're due for another first watch date. And every time I go to First Watch, I leave in tears because she loves on me. I'm looking at Pastor Ashley Staley who just came back from a missions trip. We went to Panera a couple weeks ago, and I don't cry in public, but she literally had me at the table of Panera telling me that God sees me. I'm just trying to let you know that there's room at his table, Pastor Bardo, Pastor Gladys. I could go on and on and on. We don't have time. But I want us to sit and be reminded that at the table is God's presence and his people. 
I'm going to have you stay in your seats. I'm going to pray for us. Pastor Brian's going to give us some instruction on how we can share in Jesus' table together. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us so much. Thank you for seeing fit that we would have room at your table. And Lord, (laughs) what's so beautiful is that you multiply this bread. God, that you bless it and it keeps breaking and it keeps breaking and it keeps breaking because there's room for us at the table. Regardless of where we come from, regardless of what we've done, regardless of our background, Father, remind us that we're invited to your table. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. What a privilege it is to be invited to the Lord's table. Is anybody excited about that today? And so we wanted to create a moment for each and every one of you here in this room watching online to respond to the invitation today. And so uh, I'm going to give us some instruction on how we're doing this. Uh, We're going to do it a little bit differently than we normally do it. So if you would do me a favor, go ahead and stand. What's going to happen here, you'll see in this uh, diagram, (laughs) you all sitting in the outer edges, in these outer sections here, you all will turn towards the outside walls, and you'll come down, get your elements, and then you'll return Return right up here down these side, these side idols. In the center sections here, you all will turn towards the center aisle. You'll come down, you'll get your elements, and then you also will return down these side aisles. And so the ushers are going to dismiss you row by row, starting from the rear, coming all the way forward. And so uh, I now put you in the hands of the ushers, and as you come, I just want you to prepare and posture your heart as we respond to the Lord's invitation, as we receive of his sacrifice and we rest in the finished work of the cross. Father, we remember your sacrifice. We remember the blood that was shed for us. You paid a debt that we could not have paid. And so we are eternally grateful. From our hearts flow worship. From our hearts flow gratitude. We say thank you for your sacrifice. We respond to your invitation. Let's have a meal. Let me reveal who I am. I'm your Savior. I will kneel down and wash all sin from your soul. I'm your servant and I am all you need. I'm the lamb that was slain and my blood washes you Sustain you, drink from the cup. It is my blood shed for all. I'm retention. I am all you need. I am everything. I'm the Your pure 
was at the table that would change the world. He looks at the disciples, all from different stories, different backgrounds, different <laughs> interests, all in the middle of conflict, intention. And he meets them with love. And he says, he took this bread. He says, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. I want you to take your bread for a moment. And as you're taking this bread, I want you to understand that as you're taking this bread, you're saying yes to the invitation from Jesus. Most some of us have come with different traditions and different uh, backgrounds and different uh, ways of being and believing, but Jesus actually says, if you take this bread, if you take this bread, this is, this is my body. And so he took the bread, he blessed it, he gave thanks. Just take a moment to remind yourself of the promises of God for you, for your family, 
as he blesses, that's what he was doing. He was reminding them of his promises. If you came in here feeling lonely, would you realize that Jesus says, I'm always with you? If you came in here feeling tired, remember that Jesus says, come to me, all who are tired and weary. If you came in here fearing discouraged, feeling discouraged, he says, don't grow weary in well-doing. Remember the promises. Look at the person next to you. They're a promise for you as well. I want you to break this bread the way Jesus did. Break it, take it, and eat it. His body was broken. It was beaten for our transgressions. It was beaten for our sins, for everything we've done, every thought we've thought. Every little area of our heart that's been crucified but seems like it's dying a slow death. I've taken that, he says. And then he says, I want you to go ahead. He says he took the cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and each of you who drank from it. This is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. I want you to take a moment and as you're praying over this cup, just we're going to slow this down. I don't want us to rush through this. But as you're taking of this cup, this is Jesus' blood. We don't do wine because we don't want to be a stumbling block to our brothers. But the reason why we take this cup is because Jesus says this confirms the covenant of God and his people. When you take of this cup, you are connected to a family that is eternal. When you take of this cup, you're connected to a God who is eternal and he loves you. That you're at this table because at the heart of this table is love and grace. I don't know where you came from. I don't know what lies you've heard, but I need you to hear the message of the table that he loves you. He loves you deeply. So as you drink this, allow it to penetrate. Allow it to just go through your spirit. Let's take and drink together. Give us some time just for a moment. If there are people who haven't taken and drank, just take a moment. If there are people watching online and you haven't had a chance to yet take the elements, we're waiting for you because you've got a seat of honor, the same seat of honor we have. Let's just take a moment. I want to take a moment to pray. And we've intentionally set some time up on the back end for worship. What I want to do is I want to invite our prayer partners up Our prayer partners are here, and as they come, if there are things that you're saying, I need someone to touch and agree with me. I need someone to let me know that I have a place at the table. I need someone to remind me of the place I have at the table of Jesus Christ. If that's you, if you need prayer, come and show up. Maybe you've got some other things that you've been wrestling with, that you've been walking through, and these people are not perfect like none of us are perfect, but these are people who understand the messiness of God's kingdom, and they're willing to submit and surrender and pray for you. They want to hold your arms up. Let me share this invitation to you. I don't know why we're here. But you, somebody here probably feels guilty because you've shown up at this table time and time again. You've shown up to this altar time and time again, and you're afraid that if you show up to the altar this time that people will think that you're weak, that you're whiny, that you're crazy. You'll think that somehow you're not welcoming of the table. I just want you to hear the welcome of Jesus. That's not who he says you are. You're welcome at the table. Keep coming back because this is your father's table. The same way I would respond to my daughter, come as many times as you want. So if you need to come to the altar, if you need to come to our prayer partners, if you just want to sit and worship, maybe you don't want to come to the front, maybe you just have a hand up, throw a hand up if you need prayer, and we'll find someone to come pray for you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for being a God who invites us to the table. We don't have to jump through hoops and do all types of religious rituals, but we get to participate with you at the table. 
Thank you, Jesus. I pray for healing in this place. I pray for deliverance in this place. I pray for deep, deep joy in this place. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. my cross and bore so I could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness forevermore worthy is your name Jesus you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. shame is gone. I stand amazed in your love undeniable. Your grace goes on and on, and I will sing of your goodness forevermore. Worthy is your name, Jesus. Now in the heavens, as your glory fills this place, you alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens, as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now. Oh, oh, oh. 
Father.